At 13, Elizabeth was about to lose the giant of a father whom she revered. The next decade would be the most threatening period of her life. Christmas 1546 was a gloomy one at court. For a long time, the king had suffered from an old jousting injury to his leg, which had turned into a chronic ulcer. Pus would build up, causing the leg to swell. The pain was intense. On the 30th of December, Henry completed his will, and then the descent was swift. As Henry lay dying in his bedchamber, outside, in the long gallery, Edward Seymour, Prince Edward's uncle, was pacing up and down with his advisers. They were plotting the takeover of power in the new reign. Towards two o'clock in the morning, Henry died, clutching the hands of Archbishop Cranmer, Elizabeth's godfather. To make sure that there was a smooth transfer of power, Henry's death was kept secret for three full days. Finally, all was ready, and Seymour brought together Edward, now Edward VI, and his favourite sister Elizabeth, and told them that their father was dead. One account describes how the two children threw themselves into each other's arms, weeping uncontrollably. Little King Edward VI had stepped into his father's shoes, but there were several sizes too big for him. He was just nine years old, and to begin with, he was the pawn of his powerful royal counsellors. And so was Elizabeth. Her father's will had left her rich, and her place in the line of the succession made her a tempting target. One man in particular, Thomas Seymour, had his eyes on her. The Seymour brothers, as uncles to the young king, were the most powerful family in the land. Thomas, the younger brother, was bitterly jealous of his elder brother, Edward, because Edward had made himself Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector. Edward built Berry Pomeroy Castle in Devon. It's still owned by his descendant, John Seymour. Thomas, I think, was a, a wonderfully flamboyant and colourful character. Like his brother, he was very ambitious, and he took the most of the opportunities that were presented to him. Um, he was headstrong, I think. He probably didn't think a great deal about um, what was going to happen as a result of his actions, but he, he was undoubtedly out to favour himself and make the most of his opportunities in his life, which he did. Thomas plotted his advancement to power from his base at Sewdley Castle in Gloucestershire. His first idea was to marry one of Henry VIII's daughters. Either Mary or Elizabeth would have done. But the council vetoed that idea. So Seymour went for the next best thing and proposed to Henry's widow, Catherine Parr. Catherine had already been passionately in love with him even before she married Henry, so she accepted him like a shot. Elizabeth was living with Catherine, so this meant that Seymour wasn't only her stepfather, he was also her guardian. It was a position of trust, which he abused shockingly. At first, Catherine Parr's involvement made Seymour's game seem innocent enough. Elizabeth found Seymour an intriguing playmate. He was 40, and she was just 14. Seymour saw a relationship with Elizabeth as a means of drawing closer to the throne. His game grew darker. Catherine Parr was deceived by these antics, but Cat Ashley was worried. He romped with her in the garden and cut her gown into a hundred pieces. Seymour 
now got hold of the key to Elizabeth's bedroom. He would come into her room, partly dressed early in the morning. Sometimes he would tickle her and slap her buttocks. Elizabeth was confused by Seymour's behaviour and by her reaction to it. Seymour was a handsome, sexually charged man and she was flattered by his attentions, but she was also scared by them. So sometimes she behaved as though it was all a game and play hide and seek behind the curtains of the bed. On other occasions though, Elizabeth would react as though her maidenly modesty had been outraged. She'd get up early and make sure that she was dressed so as to avoid Seymour's attentions. On the other hand, Cat Ashley, Elizabeth's governess, knew exactly what was going on. But when she reproved Seymour for risking Elizabeth's reputation, he brazened it out. He had no intention of stopping his behaviour, he said, because he meant no harm by it. But when Catherine Parr became pregnant, Seymour's flirtation with Elizabeth grew more serious. At first, Catherine could not believe what was happening. Finally, she was left in no doubt. My lord. Your grace. Following a painful interview, during which Elizabeth hardly spoke, her stepmother sent her away. 